Working in human resources can really jumpstart your need to read anything to get away from the personnel reports and the you get to's of the office space. And regardless of your career type, it's possible to move out of that path into a journey of self-discovery through being a writer. And let's not forget poetry being a great tool for self-expression, especially as we gear up for the holidays. I'm your host, Garrett K. Jones, and welcome to the November edition of The Right Way. Hey, welcome back to The Right Way, where we talk book recs, author interviews, and creative writing tips. Now, if you haven't already done so, please make sure to click the subscribe button and hit that bell for notifications on new videos just like this one. I have a great episode in store for you this month, but before we get into the details, here are a couple of announcements that are coming up. First, if you didn't catch last month's episodes, you can find the Season 6 opener and the October edition up here in this handy-dandy brand new playlist specifically for Season 6. The playlist will also include every live stream episode as well, so you don't have to go searching through different lists just to find the episode that you want to watch for this new season. And speaking of live streams, if you happen to miss that video, you'll find it right up here for your viewing pleasure. I want to take some time to talk about my writing projects during the live streams because I'm back in creative mode and I figured what better way to talk through my projects than to literally do just that. I'm also using it as an opportunity to talk about any movies or TV shows that I've been getting caught up on, as well as sharing my reviews. Lastly, I want to give you guys a chance to get connected with another project that I love working on, and that is the podcast called War of the Stars. It's a Star Wars podcast that I co-host every week with my buddy John Mark Tolley. Over the course of the last couple of months, we have been covering the run of Ahsoka on Disney+, and if you haven't listened to a single episode... You can find us on all major podcasting platforms, including Apple, Google, Spotify, and we are connected with Geek News Now and their channel on Podbean. All links are down in the video description, and I would love for you fellow fanboys and girls to give us a listen. After all, this is the way. For this month's top 10 list, I invited author Winifred Summer back onto the show to provide her personal reading recommendations. Winifred is an HR expert and the author of the Toxic Job Playbook. She was also a Writies Award winner for Best Marathon Guest as she was featured during last season's Author Awareness April Marathon. Hope Winifred provides titles that you might be interested in. Hi, I'm Winifred Summer, also known as the HR Darling Professional that you can talk to about what's going on in the workplace. But today, we're not talking about work. We are talking about my 10 favorite books. I'm very quickly going to run down the list, maybe give you a little detail about why I love the book so much, and then we're going to get out of here. So we're starting off with number 10, The One Thing. Very popular book, The One Thing, The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results by Gary Keller and Jay Papasin. 
I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, this book is great because as a person that is super creative and has so many different balls in the air that I'm juggling, the one thing helped me to see that although you can, you know, spread yourself thin and do all these things, it doesn't mean it's always the best uh, course of action when you're trying to be productive. So I highly recommend the one thing for people who are really trying to just lock in and get things done. Now, I am an author myself, okay? Uh, so, and, and also fiction. I have a nonfiction book out that's doing really well, but I'm really into fiction. So this book here, Build Better Characters by Eileen Cook, really helped me break down, you know, psychology and creating a backstory. So it says the psychology of backstory and how to use it in your writing to hook readers. This was a game changer for me as I like to create memorable characters um, and build worlds. I really haven't done a lot of fiction in a long time. So I was trying to zap myself back into creative, extra super creative mode. This book helped me. So if you're a writer, check it out. Build better characters. Number eight, Pretty Powerful, Appearance, Substance, and Success by Ebony K. Williams. I've been a big Ebony K. Williams fan for many, 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 many years. Um, she was on the news, she's done talk shows, and she was on The Real Housewives of New York. Um, she's been all over the place. I mean, she's a whole lawyer, very educated and absolutely gorgeous. And just to hear her take, you know, as a Black woman, professional woman, and the power of appearance, you know, like things that you wear, your their accessories, your, and it's not about labels and money, but it's just kind of how you represent yourself. Like what you wear tells a story. And so it's important to realize the power of your appearance. So this is a good one, especially if you're kind of coming into this space where you're trying to be more polished and put together and trying to figure out your own personal style. I highly, highly recommend. This was a good one. Just so happens we're at number seven and the title of this book has a seven in it. <laughs> the Seven Spiritual Laws of Success, A Practical Guide to the Fulfillment of Your Dreams. Sorry, my lighting isn't that uh, great by Deepak Chopra. And this book is really good because, you know, simple spiritual laws, but it's very well put together. It is a small book, so it's a pretty quick read. You could probably knock it out, you know, in a day or two. Um, so, yeah, I, I recommend this if you're really trying to center yourself and just really kind of get your, your mental right. If you're a spiritual person, these laws of success, because not just you know, laws of success. It's spiritual, spiritual laws of success. So this is a good one. I recommend it. Number six, I'm going to go with Eloquence, The Hidden Secret of Words That Changed the World by Peter Andre. This is a good one. I'm a person that never really liked the sound of my own voice. And I started to get into more public speaking, uh, podcasting, hosting, all these different things. And so this book helped me to really develop my speaking skills, should I say. Different ways that I express myself, you know, the different things like your tone and, you know, how how quick you talk, how slow you talk. Um, just little things about the way you speak that I didn't really understand too well until I got into this book. So especially if you're a person that's not traditionally um, a speaker, you will appreciate eloquence. So this is it. Number five is The Four Agreements. This is one of the few books that I read over and over and over and over again. Wow, what can I say about this? It says wisdom book right underneath and that's exactly what it is. It's by Don Miguel Ruiz and it's just about your mind, yourself being centered. I always tell people that this is a good one to read and it's one that you'll take notes it's easy to remember. It's an easy read. It's not a very big book. It is straight to the point. And that's what I love about it. So definitely the four agreements. Four, Black Fortunes. Being a Black woman, uh, reading this book really inspired me. The story of the first six African-Americans who escaped slavery and became millionaires. Talk about motivation. This is a great one by Shomari Wills. And I think everyone should read it, not just Black people. I think it's a great book for everyone. It will really make you think bigger, dream bigger. Um, so yeah, a great one, an absolute great one. Number three is Think and Grow Rich 
the legendary. It took me so long to read this book. So many people recommended it to me. And when something's hyped up a lot, it actually pushes me away. It makes me not want to read it. So once I finally got over myself and decided to read this book, it changed my life. I can see why so many people recommend it. It will definitely elevate your thinking. So Napoleon Hill. Oh, this is a good one. Number two is The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And this book is legendary. I remember it being read to me as a kid. Then I remember reading it myself as a kid and continuing it to read it every couple years. You know, it's a story about the journey of a life and what matters, you know, as, as a person going through the different stages. It's about love, it's about caring, it's about nurturing. And it really gives you something to think about. It's great for all ages. And I really think it's just a huge staple in general. Everyone and their child and their mother and their grandchild and their niece and their nephew and their neighbor um, should revisit this book time and time again. It really is, is in my heart. So gotta check it out. All right. And now we are at the number one book, my favorite book of all time, besides the Holy Bible, of course, is, drum roll please, What Becomes of the Brokenhearted by E. Lynn Harris. It is a memoir of my favorite author, E. Lynn Harris, and it was incredible. His story, his journey, how he started as a writer, and selling books out of the truck of his car and just his rise to not just being a well-known author, but he was that dude. Like I remember waiting for the release dates of the new books. It was like waiting for Beyonce tickets to go on sale. Like that's how how big of a moment it was and all the things that he was doing, the stories that he wasn't scared to tell. Elin Harris really opened up my eyes to the bravery, you know, that that can come along with writing, how you can take your work in a certain direction and be a voice for people. It is an incredible book. It inspires me. It makes me laugh. It makes me cry. Um, and, and it's a really good read. So if you want to hear a story of a person who made it, and when I say this man made it, I'm not sure if you've heard of Elon Harris, but look him up. He was an incredible author and way ahead of his time. So that is my number one favorite book. Thank you so much for joining me. I know I maybe butchered some of the names of the authors, my apologies, but those are my 10 favorite books. Now I have a whole that I love now. A whole lot of books that I love, but the ones that really stick out and shine to me are the ones that I shared with you today. So thank you so much. Again, my name is Winifred Summer, and I'm also known as the HR darling, the person that you can come to about what's going on in the workforce. Please check me out if you're interested in hearing about some HR stuff, some HR goodness. And I'm also an author myself, Shameless Plug, The Toxic Job Playbook is available on amazon.com. So yeah, follow me, check me out. Thank you for your time. And Take care. Keep reading. A big thank you goes out to Winifred for being this month's guest host. If you're interested in picking up one of the books mentioned in her segment, you can find that list of titles and their ISBN numbers down in the video description. I've been trying to get this month's interviewee on the show for the last couple of years. He was meant to be one of my guests three years ago, but things just didn't line up. Fortunately, Samir was available for this season. So please join me in welcoming Indian native and multi-genre author, Samir Saxena. All right, Samir, uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, tell me about your work and what it is that you write. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you for inviting me to your show. It's been a while that we have interacted i think last time we planned and uh, so after a long time we are here and it's a pleasure to meet you awesome yeah i'm i'm really excited i know that we uh 
we had a little bit of a, a mishap trying to get you on the show last time, and I'm glad that we're able to bring you in. Yeah, I, I write mainly uh, a mix of thriller and mixing it with some other genres. Like my first novel was a mix of romance and thriller, Sunset by the River. And after that, I have been thinking to write uh, science fiction for a long time. I had the idea for uh, about three, four years. And uh, yeah, I've just recently launched my first sci-fi novel. It's a mix of uh, science and spirituality. So I mixed two genres of spirituality and science fiction. That sounds really cool. With the, the spirituality, are you drawing from any anything that is of in particularly Indian culture or is it are you just drawing from like a generic spirituality then experiment to mix it up uh, with the general spirituality along with some Indian uh, you know folklores of Indian gods and uh, it's been a great journey and I have also uh, narrated this story it's based in US actually uh, first part is based in US and the second part is in India and uh, it's based in 100 years from uh, now, in future. After 100 years, how, you know, Western world and India interacts with each other and how, uh, you know, uh, spirituality helps the world to, you know, come out from another, uh, you can say, uh, uh, pandemic. That's really cool. Uh, so how did you get into writing? Was this something that you've always wanted to do? Um, not, not always, you know. It, it, it came... Uh, 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 step by step, you know, I was in my college and used to write some essays and some uh, long answers type. And after that, the interest in writing started to grow and I started narrating a few short play in college festivals, uh, events. And after that, you know, after uh, around, uh, after completing my engineering, I had this idea of writing my first novel, Sunset by the River, around 2016. And it took three, four years to complete my first novel. It was launched in 2020. And after another three years, I'm out with my second novel. Wow, that's pretty awesome. Now, are you working as an engineer now? I've done my engineering and I've worked as an engineer for around uh, a year. And after that, I have done... Uh, I have uh, taught in a institute. I, I was a teacher for two years. And after that, I've joined a bank. Now I'm a banker and also, uh, you can say, writer. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. What are some of the inspirations that feed into your writing? Uh, mainly mainly spirituality, you know. I, I am really uh, in awe with a lot of uh, spiritual practices, which, mm -hmm. uh, which I experienced in India. You know, uh, being an Indian, uh, we are surrounded with a lot of folklores, a lot of uh, ancient culture. A lot of uh, mixed culture, actually. We have a variety of culture in every, every 5,200 miles. And so it, it gives me uh, a really uh, great inspiration to write something, you know, which is uh, related to our Indian culture. And also, I'm also inspired uh, with a lot of, uh, you know, Western uh, stories, Western uh, folklores, uh, be it a European or be it uh, from U.S., I'm, I'm I'm really intrigued with with the stories you can say, and I take inspiration from a lot of uh, different cultures and people. So, what has been one of the hardest challenges that you have faced uh, as a writer? Mainly, uh, the main channel challenge for me is to you know uh, uh, depicting the scenarios where I have never been to. Uh, in my first novel, I've written a few chapters which were based in uh, Japan. I have never went to Japan, but I had to do some research and um, really a lot of resources like Google Earth where you can, you know, explore places without going there. Although the original research, uh, when you go to that place, uh, that hits differently. But then you have resources, you have internet, so you can try and do research of places. So it was a challenge to me to write about Japan in my first novel and to write about the uh, U.S., uh, in my second this novel, it it, it was a challenge, but uh, thanks to Google, thanks to Google Maps and all, and the images that I uh, I was able to research the places uh, quite conveniently and write write them write about the places. Just a couple more questions for you, Samir. Um, if you could give any advice to other would be authors, 
what would you tell them i'll i'll say that uh, uh be uh, be persistent and uh, don't give up so easily there there are times when you know when i feel like i am good for nothing that's uh, so whatever i'm writing i think i hope i i wonder that it's of no use but <laughs> that's what i want to convey that uh, be persistent try to give your 100% and <clears throat> whenever you feel like that uh, not writing or not getting inspiration just take a little break do stuff do uh, reading do uh, you can watch your uh, favorite show or movie and after that come back don't forget to come back to your work that's great advice so how can people get a hold of your books where where can they find you where they where can they find copies of your work uh, for readers uh, outside india they uh, they have only option of kindle it's available on kindle amazon kindle you can read uh, the kindle version and for readers in india you can find it uh, on amazon you can order from amazon and you get uh, your paperback copy and uh, or you can personally dm uh, dm me or mail me uh, to authorsameer@gmail.com i'll provide you the paperback version uh, at my, from my end awesome Well, Samir, thank you very much for being on the show. It was a pleasure to finally have you. It's a great pleasure to interact with you finally. And uh, it was really fun, uh, half an hour or whatever time we interacted. And looking forward to you again. If you're interested in picking up copies of Samir's work or connecting with him through social media, you can find those links down in the video description. Welcome back to our deep dive discussion into poetry. Last month, we covered the Japanese haiku, talking about the history and the structure of the poetic form. We also learned about lines and stanzas, which helped provide a better understanding for the structure of the haiku. This month, with November being a time usually focused on gratitude and giving thanks, I want to turn our attention to two new forms of poetry. Yes, that's right, you heard me correctly. We're going to be doing a double feature. Now, if only because this month's form really goes hand in hand. Uh, This month we are taking a look at the ode and the meditation. Both styles are meant to be focuses centered on a central theme or idea. Maybe that idea is an object or maybe it's a memory or even a person. The goal is to put in as much sensory detail as possible while keeping to the structure of the form. And that brings us to the term that we want to incorporate into this month's lesson, sensory detail. This is where you incorporate the strongest descriptions for what you as the poet want your audience, your reader, to imagine seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. There are other senses than just those five, like the sense of balance and gravity, but for now, let's keep things simple. The more detail you can provide for one of those senses, the more tangible it will become for the audience. Here's an example. Don't just say you smell smoke. Describe the fragrance or the odor of the smoke. Different sources provide different smells. Like if you fire off a gun, the smoke is going to smell of brimstone and fire and sulfur and cordite. If you describe its appearance and movement, it's not just smoke, it's a hazy gray vapor coiling out of the barrel of the firearm. Maybe the ethereal tendrils twist and dance in an elegant ballet as the gunpowder residue evanesces through the air. If you describe the way it makes you feel, you can describe how its presence might fill you with a sense of dread or excitement depending on the context of why the gun was fired in the first place. Ernest Hemingway was a fantastic writer for this very reason, because he could go on about a sensory detail and just draw in readers with his descriptions. Now before we jump into the structures of our poetic forms for this month, I wanted to touch on something that needs addressing. Back in May of 2019, I did a video for Creators Corner about avoiding passive language and showing, not telling. I want to actually go back and make a correction on that video right here and now. Going through college and taking my creative writing courses for my degree, 
I had professors and fellow students all telling me, show, don't tell. And it was something I took to heart, and quite honestly, it has helped me become a better writer. But I've come to learn that that particular adage actually has nothing to do with writing for stories or novels or even poetry. It's actually an instruction that comes from filmmaking. Far too often, directors will shoot scenes where the characters tell the audience a whole bunch of information, and it becomes this info dump. And the instruction was meant to actually have them incorporate all of that crucial information into the camera work to let the camera show so the characters wouldn't tell. Unnecessary exposition bogs down dialogue in movies, but it is 100% necessary for writing narrative and in writing poetry. With that being said, let's dive into odes and meditations. Odes are thousands of years old, and the form's name comes from an ancient Greek word meaning song. Odes are lyrical poems with an irregular meter, meaning lines can run longer or shorter depending on the needs of the poet. That's you. They are elaborately structured and used for praising or glorifying an event or a person, and because of the song-like nature of the style, rhyming is common, but it's not required. Here's an example of an ode from my book, The Lover, The Fighter, and The Philosopher. It's called Ode to Vera. Ode to Vera. You are tantalizingly out of tune, almost out of line. Your black zippered nylon covering is easily removed before I play you. Curvaceous body, your hips are evenly spaced, though your shoulders are uneven, dipping one lower as if to cradle it over my leg. As you hang about my neck and across my lap. Long neck, fretted and dotted with simple tattoos of musical scale, a high-strung head ready to be keyed, one string, two string, with four strings more. The G string is the one that constantly falls from pitch and gives me trouble before I play on you, with you. And like a gun blasting out sudden bullets of chords and notes, rapid fire music coats the walls and ceilings of my apartment. Musician and instrument moving like a song, flowing like a melody, adding harmony, Rhythm and rhyme to me and you before our time and composition are through. When it's over, I place you, my guitar, back into your synthetic womb. Meditations are similar to odes in that they focus on an event or person or a larger memory or experience. The biggest difference is the length. Odes are relatively short. Uh, think in terms of songs with only which only lasts for a few short stanzas. Meditations are far longer, lasting for several lengthy stanzas, even a few pages. Meditations are stream of consciousness, writing uh, and letting your mind and words flow without any thought towards structure, stanza, or line length, or any regard for rhyme, meter, or the things of that particular nature. The funny thing is that the meditation itself can veer in different topical directions so long as you circle back to the primary focus. Here are three tips for writing either one of these forms. First, make sure that you focus on as much concrete imagery as possible. Don't say something sounded good or sounded sweet. How did it sound good? Or how sweet was the song? Was it melodic, like the song played by an expert harpist? Was it enticing, like the voice of the sirens luring uh, you see word into their blessed demise. Be as detailed as possible. Tip two, don't focus on the length of your lines or if you're writing a meditation, your stanzas. Just write without structure and let the lines flow as they will. And lastly, tip three, don't worry about rhyming. If something pops up naturally or organically on its own, great. Go with that. But don't go out of your way to add any rhyming into your poem. So, I like to give a prompt, and here it is. Since we are getting into the holidays, write an ode or a meditation about your favorite holiday. Describe in detail why this is your favorite holiday. Describe in detail who shows up to celebrate and how you and your friends and family go about the celebration. Give glimpses, glimpses of the traditions and how they're practiced. 
When you're done, you can connect with me on X or Instagram at GKJ underscore publishing or by emailing me at gkjpublishing at gmail.com. I would love to read your poetry and give you feedback on anything that you send me. Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and click the bell for notifications when new content is released. Make sure to tune in next week for my live stream, and I look forward to next month's episode featuring an interview with short story writer Ben Sheridan and new book recs from children's author Chris Weimer. See you then.